Hi everyone, in this short little video I just want to talk about the difference between potential GDP and actual GDP. Now you could talk about the difference between real GDP and potential real GDP or nominal GDP and nominal potential GDP. I'm just going to talk about, I mean, and I, I just don't want to go into that level of detail. Um, so instead I'm just going to focus on real GDP and real potential GDP, which I'm just going to call potential from now on. All right. So think of real GDP as the actual amount of goods and services that an economy can produce. So for the United States in 2012, real GDP, oops, excuse me, real GDP was equaled 13,593.2 billion dollars. In other words, 13 point, roughly six trillion dollars worth of goods and services were produced in the United States in uh, 2012. Now, potential GDP is not something that we actually observe. It's something that we have to infer. And the government, specifically the Bureau of Economic Analysis, goes ahead and calculates potential GDP. And the way it does is it has a way of trying to guess what output would be if resources in the economy were fully employed. That means if we were at full employment. Now remember, full employment doesn't mean every single person has a job. It just means the only people who are unemployed are those who are unemployed for structural reasons, because they lack the skills to get a job, or for frictional reasons. They've left one job to look for another. So think of potential GDP as a theoretical construct. It's the level of output that would exist if all resources, land, labor, and capital were full, fully utilized. So I'll just call this potential GDP. And the details of how the government calculates this is actually not all that critical right now. The values I'm using come from the Congressional Budget Office, so they're pretty standard values. And according to the CBO, potential output was 14,000 four hundred and eleven billion dollars in 2012. In other words, potential output was higher than real GDP. So we had the potential to produce even more goods and services than we actually did. And since GDP is also income, we have the capacity to we had the capacity to generate even more income than we actually did. Alright. Well if you look at the difference between the two, so if you look at real GDP minus potential, right, that's going to equal 13,593.2 minus 14,411.0. I'll ignore the units of billions, and you come up with negative 817.2, meaning we were producing below capacity by 817.2 billion dollars. So had we had full employment and all the factories and all the land, labor, and capital were fully utilized in 2012, we would have generated $817.2 billion more worth of income, more $817.2 billion more worth of goods and services for people in the, in the economy that we could have used you know, to satisfy, satisfy whatever wants and desires we had. So there was a pretty big gap. In fact, if you were to go ahead and calculate the size of the gap, something we actually call the output gap. Well, actually, let me erase this. The output gap is just equal to real GDP over potential. minus 1. And again, by convention, we multiply by 100, so that 5% um, is 5 and 10% is 10, okay? Because it's a lot easier to work with whole numbers than decimals for a lot of people. Well, if you do this, then you're going to end up with minus 5.7%, which means the economy was 5.7% below capacity or below potential in 2012. So incomes could have risen for everybody by 5.7% on average if we had found some way to go ahead and um, increase real GDP up to potential. And to a large extent, that's what monetary and fiscal policy are worried about, but we'll get to those later on in the course. All right, so the key thing to take away here is real GDP, that's the actual amount of stuff that's produced. Potential GDP, that's the amount of stuff that would be produced if the economy were at full employment. All right. 
So we'll just go ahead and stop there.